I'm Edward Funk, and this is podcast number 12, and where we left off uh, in podcast number 11, uh, it really kind of hit bottom, and then I got a job working for my cousins and the family C-Corp business, and my life had really turned around. So, I love that job. And, and part of it would have me running all around the Corn Belt interviewing farmers and salespeople uh, that I'd write profiles on. I remember there's this one guy uh, that lived in Canada, and it's, uh, he had uh, kind of ruddy skin, blue eyes, very dark hair. I th- he's quite handsome. Uh, and what I really remember about him, he's told me that when he was in the field, he listened to PBS all day long. And I thought, you know, that's interesting that, that farmers are, or at least can be, better informed than practically anybody else. Now, after I returned home <clears throat> from Vietnam, I really, I tried that stateside marijuana and decided uh, It was so wimpy, I wasn't even going to bother. Uh, And and then eventually I realized why uh, the the pot in Vietnam was, at least often the case, laced with opium. So you can imagine how that made a big difference. It was a hallucinogen, whatever that word is. Uh, For instance, if I walked by the border pit, you know, totally sober, I'd see little red sparks fly out. But if I'd been smoking marijuana and I'd, I'd uh, walk by, I'd see huge flames uh, darting out. And the reason <clears throat> I kind of was certainly back to marijuana, uh, I'd get really overstimulated with some of my work and then I'd go back to that cycle of one sleepless night after another. And I realized if I smoked a little pot, that, that I could get to sleep. So, <clears throat> without drinking, now pot, I thought of it as my acceptable elixir. Well, back to that guy in Canada, and that trip to Canada, uh, I ended up on a Friday night uh, in, in Toronto, and that was, I discovered uh, a gay bathhouse. And uh, I thought, wow, this was great. You could have sex with, without any <coughs> accountability. No one looking for anything more than that. Uh, so that was the beginning of all that. Uh, now, the first week of December, 1978, I got a call from SeaWorld asking me if I'd be interested in uh, SeaWorld of Ohio. I I never even realized there was a SeaWorld of Ohio. Uh, They invited me out to San Diego to have a meeting to discuss what that job would entail. And you know, I had so much freedom with that, that job with the seed company that I was able to get away for a couple of days with, without having to be accountable. So, anyway, I told him I'd let him know in a couple of days. And then I thought, you know, just slightly over a year ago, I, I was still uh, held captive by my alcoholism. And <clears throat> here I was being aggressively courted by SeaWorld for a marketing job. It just seemed unbelievable to me. So I called SeaWorld back a few days after I came back to Kellen and said, yes, I'd like the position. Now Bob and Don and Dick they, they were all sincerely happy for me. So then we 
Sue Rhodes flew me to Los Angeles for a meeting with the advertising agency. Uh, and it was a small agency. It was called Rogers and Weiss. And these were a couple of guys who had been in a much bigger agency that had Sue Rhodes as an account. And then they decided they'd start their own agency. Uh, and with Sue Rhodes being the, the major part of what they did. I remember thinking that year at the Edward J. Funkinson's Christmas party that I was moving on and that Bob, Don, Dick would remain with that family business for the rest of their lives. Well, where was I wrong? But, but that's getting ahead of the story. So I reported to Ohio um, the day after Christmas and I stayed at the Aurora Inn in Aurora, Ohio. And it was really this neat place. It was um, kind of reminded me of the Inn at White Christmas, Bing Crosby's White Christmas. But I remember lying in bed that night and I just couldn't get warm. Uh, and I'm curled up and I started thinking, what, what have I done? Uh, in my year back in Kentland, I, I renewed old friendships, made new friendships. Uh, I become very attached to Dick, Elena, and their kids. Uh, I was walking away from a lot. What was I walking towards? It, it made me teary-eyed. So SeaWorld of Ohio opened in 1970, six years after SeaWorld in San Diego. Uh, now, because of Ohio's mother, it's only open from Memorial Day to Labor Day. But the corporate bosses had calculated back in 1976 that uh, you look at the bulk of the population of the United States, in the, both the Mideast and the Midwest, and it'd be the perfect place to draw a huge uh, population for the park. Now, that was before the U.S. population was taken a decided uh, shift to the south and to the west. SeaWorld in Ohio uh, in the wintertime was a bizarre experience. Nothing was really happening. My immediate boss, who was the marketing director at that park, he, he had a hard time thinking of things for me to do. One, one assignment was to call the various distributors that, that, that had these uh, racks for brochures placed uh, throughout Ohio and, and beyond, uh, to call these guys in and ask them for the exact dimensions of their racks. And I remember one guy saying, you've got to be kidding me. It's such a ridiculous thing to do. Uh, During this vacuum of purposeful activity, there is plenty of time to get to know everybody. That included Susan, not her real name, who worked in human resources. I'd pretty much given up that I'd have uh, heterosexual relationships with the, with the women. Uh, but having said that, I was far from being out or, or even wanting to be out. Now, Susan seemed interested in me, and uh, that was very flattering. Uh, she was pretty. She had shoulder length hair. She had green eyes that were kind of wide apart, and a smile that was even wider. Uh, she had a dry sense of humor. And with hours to kill every day, uh, I spent more and more time chatting with her. She had an early marriage. And I think she was only 17, in which she had a son named Robbie, uh, whose father, she was already the fourth son by the time Robbie was born. She, by the time I knew her, she was second in command at uh, SeaWorld's sea Human Resources. Uh, and Robbie, not his real name, was six. Now, I was lonely and I thought Susan and I could spend a lot of time together just being friends. Uh, including outside of work, of course. 
the first time we went out, I asked her to, uh, and, and invited Robbie as well, to go to an ice skating rink in uh, Kent. Uh, and the three of us spent an hour, uh, we were just horrible. We, we all were having our ankles turned inward, and that's about as much progress as we made it. Uh, sometime later, Susan said she was really amazed that some guy would, would ask a girl, girl out and then demonstrate something that he was so totally inept. But for me, this I wasn't thinking that really as a date. I was just thinking that it's something fun to do. So, but it didn't take long before we became intimate. Part of me was encouraged to, you know, maybe I still have a heterosexual life. Uh, but another part of me felt I was being dishonest. One night I opened up to Susan and told her about my situation. Her response was, well, let's just see how it goes. After that, we spent much of our free time together. I got a kick of how Susan and Robbie worked together as such a team. I, I remember on cold mornings, while Susan is still getting dressed, Robbie would go out to the carport and start the car. Uh, he, he was a fun kid to be around. Now, my apartment in Kent was within walking distance of where that Kent State shooting had taken place. Uh, in earlier podcasts, I talked about how disturbed I was when, when I came home from Vietnam. Now, the, the, the shooting had occurred just a couple months at the most before I came home. How disturbed I was that this was dominating the news and, and hardly anyone was talking about the soldiers still being killed in Vietnam. Uh, so one night I took a walk down to where that happened. It was within walking distance of me. Uh, and I could actually see where there's some uh, remnants of our bullets and some concrete. And I, 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 I could bring back to my mind uh, a picture of those four protesters. Uh, what would happen is the National Guard opened fire and killed four people. And, and so I'm thinking about those four people and I could remember one kind of a young teenager, overweight girl, long dark hair. And you know, here I was pondering all this, and then I realized in the years between that and where I was, so much had happened in the country and in my life. Um, in the country, um, Vietnam ended, and uh, we got through Watergate. In my own life, I had gone from being deeply lost to, to being found again. And, and I just thought it was time to put all that away, both Vietnam and Kent State. I was still a daily runner. And one night, Susan was over at my apartment. She said, don't you have something sweet to eat? And I thought about it for a minute. I said, oh yeah, I do. I, I have some raisins. And she looked at me, she said, you are pathetic. During my first weekend in Ohio, I bought a new car. I mention this because it's the only new car I've ever bought in my entire life. It was a 1979 kind of reddish Volkswagen Rabbit. Uh, I paid $5,028 for it. My extras were rust proofing, uh, floor mats and an AM radio. And I named the car Klaus. Klaus and I were together for the next <clears throat> 14 years. Now in May, a large cargo plane arrived from the San Diego park, carrying our big stars, including Shambu, the killer whale, dolphin seals, etc. Shamu and the dolphins 
traveled in slangs uh, that were continuously irrigated during the flight. And then when they arrived in Ohio, they were transported by trucks. And, and then when they got to the park, they were lifted into the pools by cranes. It was kind of exciting to see all this happening. And, and the local press was there uh, to uh, record everything and kind of alert everyone that the park would just be opening in a few days. And once the park did open, it was very, very busy. Uh, and it offered more than the aquatic shows, especially shows that summer. There was a lumberjack show. Uh, there was a Ray Berwick Birds of Prey show. He, he was the trainer that trained uh, Alfred Hitchcock's birds for the movie The Birds. And there was a water uh, ski show. And then there were kind of special one-night shows. Uh, one of them, uh, they were for niche audiences. And one of them featured a young entertainer her name was Leif Garrett. He was 17 years old and, and the audience was really a preteen audience. Well, his manager asked me if there was a phone that he could use. I said, sure, he could, he could use the phone in my office. And, and I could overhear him, this poor kid. He was 17, but a young 17. And he was crying on the phone, talking to his mother, just saying how badly he wanted to come home. Now, the advertising agency in Los Angeles, there is an account executive assigned to uh, the Ohio Park, and his name is John Tripp, uh, and he grew up in Santa Monica, and the actor uh, Cedric Hardwick, Hardwick uh, lived on a park. So, you know, we had very different growing up experiences, but, but we discovered we had a lot in common. For one thing, we were the same age. For another thing, we'd both been in Vietnam. And after the weeks went by, we started feeling safe, uh, kind of being critical of the higher-ups uh, for all the things we thought they were doing that just didn't make any sense. The friendship between John and I would grow throughout the years. and. Unfortunately, about five years ago, uh, due to complications from Agent Orange, he passed away. Uh, I'm still in touch with his widow. So one evening in the fall, after the park had closed, I was over at Susan's and I was kind of roughhousing with uh, Robbie, and she signaled me, signaled me to come into the kitchen, and, and I did. She said, uh, "Just watch it. I don't want him becoming too attached to you." And I, I could have finished the rest of that thought. It was, "I don't want him becoming too attached to you if you're not going to stick around." So, of course, I felt quite guilty. And I'd had gay sex since I'd been with uh, Susan, and I told her about it. Um, and more and more, I'm realizing that our experiment uh, for me to be heterosexual wasn't going to be successful. I remember having a conversation with her. I, I was on the phone. I was working late at the office, and I was just explaining that, that it just wasn't going to work. And um, the truth was I loved her, and it's because I loved her that I knew I had to say adios because it wasn't going to work. So the advertising manager position in Florida opened up uh, about nine months after I got to Ohio. and. Uh, I, I said, to, of course, I want to do it, and I would have wanted to do it anyway, but it, make it made it easier to uh, separate from Susan. Now, living in Florida would open up an entirely new adventure.
adventures in my life. So you'll find out about that in the next podcast. Thank you.